Uh, so last one uh, for election and predestination. And I thought God's grace is probably the best place to end it. Uh, we can talk about all the little things that we have done uh, over this past um, month. And um, we can talk about the intricacies of what it means and election and predestination. I'll talk a little bit about that in this sermon, uh, how it relates to that. But on the whole, uh, without God's grace, none of this stuff happens in the first place. Predestination doesn't happen. Election doesn't happen. We're not elected if there's no grace. Uh, grace is what holds everything together. And so I think this is probably a good way to end, to, to kind of point us back to the most important reason, to worship an amazing God who's given us this space to choose him out of love. Even that love is imperfect from our side. Uh, but to, to choose him because of what he's done for us, uh, that's something that I just cannot get over as I've studied this. I can't think, as I look more into who we are as a people, as human beings, I think, why would we don't deserve this grace? This grace is just amazing, as the words of the song say. So, we talk about God's grace. We talk about how God's grace in general uh, is... Uh, just uh, uh, absolutely amazing. But of course, also in regard to election and predestination, um, <clears throat> when it comes to understanding the important role, excuse me, <coughs> the important role of grace in election and predestination, I think it makes God's plan for redemption all the more amazing. Uh, and I look at this and I think I just, I'm just flabbergasted. Uh, which is a great word, I love that word, uh, by how God's grace, it, it just covers us all. Um, but let's start, let's begin by understanding how we might sometimes understand grace in our everyday conversation, because I think this is quite important, um, just to get an idea of how we might not fully appreciate the words we use. Uh, and we say certain Christian things, we say, uh, and they're good, and they're good and healthy things to say to each other and to bless each other. Um, but maybe if we just maybe understand the words that we're using, it might be helpful uh, just to just to make, make us think about these things. Uh, there is um, a popular response Christians use. I've heard a lot, either in a WhatsApp group somewhere uh, or, or just in general passing with other Christians. And it's normally towards the end of a conversation. And, it, and someone might say this. Uh, they say, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you Sunday. And the response back is, by God's grace. By God's grace, I'll see you then. By God's grace, I'll come. By God's grace, I'll see you next time. The more traditional saying we might uh, understand this to be is, there but for the grace of God, I go. On one hand, it seems quite innocent and seemingly humble thing to say, and it is, by the way, it is if, if within the context we're saying it, we truly understand what that grace is uh, when we're saying these words. Uh, if it's said with an understanding of what it means. Uh, but you see, in reality, when we think about these words, I think probably when we're saying them, we're thinking that God's grace is just there to, I might, uh, this is more of a literal understanding, I'll be here tomorrow if I'm still here, if I'm still around by God's grace, if I'm still in this body by God's grace. But God's grace is, is not literally keeping us breathing or living in the practical sense. Uh, without God's grace, we wouldn't even be here. So there's, a, there's certainly a thing to start from from that point of view. But it does allow us to live and breathe and go about our daily lives. It does allow us to continue in these bodies and in this world and in this society. Uh, and in fact, it is far more serious than it being a decider of whether I'll be around tomorrow or not. It's far more bigger than that. And while it's a statement of humility and gratitude, which is good, in its true meaning, it's an acknowledgement of one's own sinful nature and the need for God's grace. So remember, when we say these words to people, this is what we're saying. In a very short gospel kind of sharing moment we say by God's grace and what I'm saying is because I need it because I'm sinful and I need God's grace on my life otherwise my sin will send me to hell 
But how do we know we fully un- embrace that, that understanding? When we sin, we deserve eternal separation from God. And this needs to be a reality for many more Christians who struggle to embrace that sin and the need for repentance is a very real thing. It's not to make us feel down. It's not to make us feel depressed. But to help us understand the beauty of God's grace in a situation where we are undeserving. Romans 6 verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, to understand, accept, and know that what we've done in sin produces death, only to then be offered the greatest reprieve of all time is the first step in truly appreciating God's grace. Maybe a more more visual way, a visual cue of seeing this particular verse might be helpful. Uh, For the wage of sin is death. In between is grace. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, the end result of believing in Jesus Christ. Why is there grace in between this? Because we don't die immediately. Adam and Eve did not die immediately after sinning. Within that moment is grace. Within that very moment that they choose to sin against God, as we have chosen to, God's grace holds everything. Punishment is not immediate. And this bit in the middle is where everyone is right now. Whether you're a believer or not, everyone is in this place. Matthew 5, verse 45, he says he he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We stand, all of us, in this place of grace. God loves the whole world. That's what grace is. Grace is God loving the whole world, wanting them, all of us, to come to him. He loves both good people and evil people. But let's be clear, he does not give a pass to evil things. It doesn't mean just because he loves them, therefore he affirms everything that they will do, everything that we will do. So everyone has to be loved. Grace is loving all people. No matter who we are, what we've done, and what we are guilty of. The point here is that the life we experience is only because God provides the working environment in which we exist, that by his grace, at least for now, we get to choose by his grace what we do with it and what we do with our lives. God sees to it that all people experience the abundance of the earth he created. But the question we have to ask is, to what end? Is grace simply a means to experience the physical life, the world around us, before we pass away? Or is it the chance to experience it to the degree that it's meant to lead us to understand something greater than ourselves? Romans 1 would certainly bear that out and say that actually the world around us is an example, a evidence of God's grace, God's creation. Let me take you into my world of computers. Do you know what this is? You've probably never seen it. I'll tell you why you've never, I don't know, I wouldn't say why you've never seen it. I don't know what it is. I didn't know what it was until I researched it. And what I wanted to find was what was the earliest computer ever invented? And this is the first computer that we know of. It's the Antikythera, Kythera, Antikythera, a mechanism it's called, Antikythera mechanism. 200 BC to 70 BC, roughly, it was made. And what this does, it's an ancient Greek hand-powered mechanical device. And and archaeologists believe it was used to calculate uh, eclipses and other astronomical events. This is quite something, isn't it? It's quite an achievement. We have great minds, people who can think of these things and think, how can we see 
God's creation? How can we see it working? Does anyone know what this is? There's a clue in the picture. Give you a bit of time. Is he? Sort of. Nearly there. I saw this in the uh, Science Museum. This is fascinating. Uh, you know premium bonds? Yeah? This was the first truly random number generator uh, in the world. So only one is the first random generating number generating machine. Uh, because what happens is, and here's the logic behind this, if you try and use a computer, as it were, to give you random numbers, computers fall into a pattern of producing numbers. Uh, because they're, they're created by us, they're programmed by us. So we import a pattern, even unwittingly, we do that ourselves. And so this machine was created to create uh, random numbers for picking premium bond numbers. It's first truly random. The name, I think Ernie is better, but what it stands for is kind of like, this is a bit awkward, uh, electronic random number indicator equipment. So I think Ernie is probably the better name. It was Ernie. There's only there's four Ernies, by the way, four. Yeah, this is the first one. Uh, but these are a truly great invention. So, so me and Dawn years ago saw this. This was in, I think it was in the Science Museum. They did a whole exhibit on it on the, on the early computers at the time. Uh, and, it, and it's just fascinating how it works. It doesn't necessarily work as a computer, as we know today, uh, in that same way. Great inventions. Uh, and, and they've led to more advancements in, uh, in the world, in the computer world. But these discoveries, these inventions we make have one major principle behind them. They're an output of what we see already exists. So we're trying to make sense of the world. And what we don't do is what I saw on one particular web page is we don't, we cannot invent numbers. We can't invent maths. We can't, we discover maths, we discover numbers, we discover how things work. And all these inventions lead us to show, well, a bit more insight into how the world works, how it already is established by God. And so inventions in themselves are not evil. They're not horrible things. They're not things we should reject. Even as much as you might hate computers, you might hate the internet. They're not things we should necessarily reject. They can be helpful tools, uh, but certainly how we use them uh, is, is certainly something we should think about ourselves. But in other words, that the anti <laughs> antikythera device, the one I showed you earlier, it showed us a process that already existed in creation. It helps us to see how God's world works. The Ernie machine was not an invention of randomization. Uh, in fact, uh, you can think about, when we think about maths of how random things are, in fact, it turns out things are not so random as we thought. Uh, it turns out that even randomization is in itself, has some form of modeling, has some way of working together. We still can't grasp it very well, but it, it does have a pattern, but maybe a pattern is hard for us to see. But in order to produce each random number in this machine, it had to fire a physical event. So to avoid one number having any reference to the next number. And for this, what it used was something called the, it, it used the random voltages generated at the terminals of the cold cathode tubes as its primary source of random events. Do you understand that? <laughs> it's firing electrodes into. This is what cathodes are. It, in a, there's many different pictures of cathodes. There's old ones which are bigger. Um, you might find them in TV, TVs, old televisions at the time, um, but these are more modern ones. And all they do is they fire, and they, that's how they light up, they're firing energy into the cathode, and, it, and then it lights up. Uh, and, but the randomization of the firing itself is something they couldn't control, which is why they chose to fire that voltage into it, because it was, they couldn't predetermine how much would go into it, how more, how less each time it fired. But even the voltage, the thing that generated the electrical voltage was itself from God's creation. It is something that God already put there for us to discover and so use. 
So the process behind all these things, all these inventions that we find is very much a natural one. You can only produce voltage from what is available uh, in the universe to make it all happen. We can only produce anything of what's already existing in the universe. And, and here's my point, why I go into these examples at all. It's only by what has been made that anything can be discovered. Uh, it is why it is why the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. Because for us there cannot there isn't. If we if we truly think about the reality, the truth of the situation, is that there is nothing new, not for God, nothing new under the sun. For God created the sun that the things are under, and He created the things that are under the sun in the first place. So He has full control over all the things that He has created. No one can make something new. There are things that have always been there. But over time, we've learned to understand them and what they are. And so we produce a meaningful way to express that understanding. Uh, one example of probably where we went too far, um, amongst many, is a Tower of Babel. When we talk about the Tower of Babel, it is about human beings trying to be God. And what they did, they worked together to try to make themselves into gods themselves. That they wanted to build this tower so high that they would be gods. The tower is, is not the problem. The heart is the problem. The reason why they did it is the problem. So the inventions are not the problem. But what's the motive behind doing something at all in the first place? What's the motive behind inventing anything? By God's grace, we are able to discover these things. And by his grace, we are free to use them and apply them to our lives, even for the advancement of humanity. But this advancement means nothing if all it serves to do is to make the physical better now. It might serve in healthcare. It might serve in, a, in a, a tremendously positive way to help people not be ill. It might even help us to advance our understanding of the universe. But what worth is that when we're no longer on this planet in our physical bodies and facing a holy God? What does it mean? It's all nothing if it doesn't point you back to the creator who made it in the first place. All my achievements, all my things that I've done, it actually doesn't mean anything on the day when I meet him. Because it will be about what I've done and my heart and my belief in Jesus. Do I believe in him? Is he my saviour? He won't ask me about my career. He won't ask me about all the things I've achieved. I'll be asked questions about all the decisions I made, the life choices I made, and ultimately, do I believe in his son who has given his life for mine so that I may live? And when I, when I accepted that, did I live a life that was serving of Jesus Christ? All the plastic surgery, our obsession with looking youthful today, Men and women's makeup products will not be there to distract us anymore. They won't be things that God is impressed with. We won't have time to put on our Sunday best when we meet God. God will see us for who we truly are. What will come is a time of judgment. But grace, grace is God delaying his judgment to allow many to come to salvation. You see, God right now is pouring out goodness and mercy to all people by his grace. And when I kept thinking about what this means, I think in every moment to moment, as even we are here right now, that the breaths that I take, the milliseconds that we exist in, grace is operating. And then I start understanding why did they go on about grace so much in the Bible? Why did they love it so much? Why did they worship God for this gift? 
It's because from moment to moment, I'm living in the gift of God. I'm living in the gift of grace. How can I not be thankful for that? But that grace, that grace does not save us. Its purpose is to reveal to us a patient, loving God. He wants all people to see the kindness and love that he has for all mankind. You see, to truly understand grace is with every second that passes in our lives, we are to constantly be aware of the coming righteous judgment of God when we leave this place and meet him. That we want to always be ready to be able to say to God, it is by grace I have been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 says, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, in the subject that we talk about, we have to keep coming back to these verses that we've been studying over this month because they say what needs to be said, even if we have to repeat them. The, the, the richness within the verses are such that you have to keep coming back to them. But when we say words like, there but for the grace of God I go. It is not to hope that you'll be around tomorrow, that I'll be around tomorrow, but that whatever happens, I've used God's grace wisely and accepted Jesus so that even if I'm not around tomorrow, I stand only by the grace of God and his son Jesus Christ, who I trust and believe in. It is the grace of God that I'm here it is the grace of God that I'm not here. Does that make sense? Paul says it doesn't matter whether I live or die. I want to be with my saviour actually. But whilst I'm here, I will do the work that he has set before me. Philippians 1, 23 to 24. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. This is where Christians who understand grace have to stand. It is like being torn in two. When you believe in Jesus, when you truly accept him as your savior, there is a tug of war between the flesh and the spirit. And whilst at the same time, I, I don't want to leave this place, but at the same time, the pain-free, painless, new body, new life in Jesus. That's tempting, isn't it? I also want to be there as well. Of course I want to be with Jesus. Of course we should want to be with Jesus, away from our pains and our troubles of this life. But we should also want to know the grace of God in this life. Why is that important? Because my experience in this life, to some degree, helps me appreciate more that which is coming next. I see what God does and I see, I read the Bible and I see what happens in the world and I go, wow, the Bible is absolutely spot on, as hard as it is to see at the same time. And all that does is reinforce my faith in God even more so. So there's, it's not good to have a shortcut. It's not good to just go straight there. There's a, there's, there's a learning to be done. There's an understanding to be done. When I get there, I can understand grace even more. I can understand the power of this grace. And my appreciation of it is ever more so because I've learned in trouble, in trial, in struggle, in strife. The grace of God today is this small taste of the perfect heavenly place believers will be in with a holy God. It's a small, small taste. So when it comes to grace in election and predestination, we first understand that what grace has done has created a space for us 
to become believers in Christ. As a group of believers who are predestined to be with him. So let's look at, I finish this um, last session by just looking at probably the most important verses on this topic. Again, we have looked at, but we'll look in more detail. John three sixteen to 18. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, uh, but have eternal life. The simple way to understand these verses right from the off is that God so loved the world. God simply decided through his righteousness and perfectness of character to simply love us. And these verses, therefore, are saturated in grace. But then also describes a grace that has a purpose. Whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes. A holy God who invokes grace upon the whole of mankind and says, whoever of you believes in Jesus shall be with me forever. The undeserving thing is just then, I really do not deserve this, God. I don't deserve this. He says, you're right, you don't deserve it because it's a gift from me to you that you could do nothing about. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but for it to be saved through him. And God would have been just as righteous and justified to have condemned the world. He would have been perfectly within his character and his rights to have condemned the whole world. But he chose not to. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him but what stopped him from righteously condemning the entire world it started with this gracious abundant love for his creation of which he chose to do first and so while i believe that god does not make my salvation decision for me i equally believe that were it not for God not justly condemning the world for its sin and instead sending his son, I would not have the space to make that decision at all. When we move to the last verse, we see that God's grace makes it possible for us to make the choice between the only two choices. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And now some might say, well, that's not fair because I only have two choices. Believe in Jesus or not. But then we have to look at the other way and say, by the grace of God, We have two choices. Do you understand we had zero choices before? Do you understand that in our sinfulness, we had none? Zero. But God's grace brings two choices. One, to reject him entirely and to go to hell. You've already decided. You've chosen your destination. Or choose God. Choose Jesus Christ who paid for your sin. Acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior and you will be saved. I don't need more choices. I need less. The world doesn't need more choices. It needs clarity in those two choices. And there's so much going on in this one verse alone. But this is why we have to understand the gift of grace fully as Christians. We are undeserving of any choice at all. In fact, we are only deserving of one outcome, judgment and hell. But not only 
did God send his son to die for all sinners. But by that act, he doesn't mandate the choosing of some and not others. Instead, he gives us grace to make the choice. He sent his son, and I think about this logically, I think if, if I'm, I don't know how you describe this, you don't say if I'm God I do this, but maybe to some degree it is. If I have to send my son to die because I'm a sinful person, sinful human being fallen, here's what I think I would do. I would, I would mandate people's decision for them. That's my son that's died for you. So you're going to accept him. Do you see the difference, though, in contrast to my selfishness and to God's grace? He sent his one and only son. And instead of saying, you're going to believe because I'm going to make you do it because I've sent my son. He still says, choose me over the world. He gives us grace to make the choice. Jesus Christ and his death on the cross is in itself the demonstration of his grace to all people who rejected him and sinned against him in the hope that they would choose him. God says he has done what he has decided was just and right to make a way between him and mankind while remaining true to his holy character of love, grace, mercy and forgiveness. But the parameters do not change. Just as in this world we have cause and effect, so in the choice between believing in Jesus or not is a cause and effect. We live in a world that every day loves to deny the effect of our own choices on everyone else around us. At least in this world we can blind ourselves to it. We we're very good at blinding ourselves to the truth. Not because we're naive, because that's an excuse. It's because we are selfish. It's because God is right about us. And so God says here, your choice will have consequence and effect. And even by that, that's grace. Your decision itself will determine an outcome that God has laid down. Either choose him or choose the world. It will be on all of us to choose Christ over the world. And when we make the choice, we will do it knowingly and without excuse. And for me, this defined, clearly laid out choice only expresses more so how great the grace of God is now that we can praise God for that grace, a sinner saved by grace through faith in Jesus. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. On one hand, we have a God who is wholly patient with us, Wanting us to come to know him, repent of our sins, and so be in relationship with him once again. On the other hand, we have the same God who is not slow in keeping his promises. For those who believe in Jesus, we patiently wait for the fulfillment of this final promise of his return. For those who do not, God is patient. But in either case, the promise will still be delivered. The time will still come. We should pray as Christians that this gift of grace be seen for what it really is. A chance to know the creator God and to know the person, his son Jesus, before it's too late. So God's gift of grace should humble us. It should first, of course, make us feel like I'm rubbish. I don't deserve this amazing gift. But, but his purpose is not to leave you there. This is the amazing thing of grace. His purpose is not to make you feel bad. 
is to make you see who you really are. And in doing so, you see the need for Jesus in your life. How can I be rescued from the brokenness that's always been there that I've hidden from, that I've denied, that I've pushed down? Grace is that hand to lift us up from the darkness. And so it should humble us. It should humble us that it's not our doing or even our right to claim any portion of God's grace. But he gave it to us. That should impact us in such a way every day that this grace is for a limited time and before he returns. We should continue to be humble messengers of God's grace, knowing its full purpose. This is why it's really important that when we engage with people who are not believers, who we're, we're having discussions with, talking about God, talking about faith, we want them to know the truth, absolutely. But they have time. God is patient with them. So we have to strike a balance when we have these chats with people, these discussions about the bigger things of God. Be humble messengers showing how much God's grace has affected me. When we go and talk to people, it should be evident to some degree that God's grace has had an impact on my life. I don't need to argue with the person in front of me, even if they don't believe me, even if they are horrible to me. Because what's happened is I've understood grace because grace is on my life and I've gone, I've accepted this amazing grace and I want you to see a tiny, imperfect picture of how it's affected me. I may not be, uh, none of us may be as good as God in showing that grace, of course, but we can reflect the grace of God. We can show how it's changed us. And this will help many more people as we come to speak to them about Jesus. So I want to leave you with these verses. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Let's pray and let's worship our Lord today.